Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. The chicken has not awoken yet this morning. I have not heard him crowing at all. Speak of the devil. So we're going to try to record as much of this video as possible before he wakes up. Hopefully you can't hear me through the window. <laughs> First Chronicles chapter 11 is the topic of today. There's a free PDF on our website if you want to go download it. Uh, it's available there and there's a bunch of other links down in the description if you want to check those out. When was the book of First Chronicles written? It was written several hundred years after the reign of King David, but it's about the reign of King David. That's, that's our main character, it's David. So he reigned from approximately... 1055 to 1015 BC. So the events recorded here are taking place within that time frame. Now on to section number two, the rooster still hasn't woken up. David is of course our first and main character. He was the second king over all Israel and Judah. His predecessor Saul is going to be mentioned very briefly in this chapter. He was the first king of Judah and Israel. Joab. Joab is going to become David's commander, the commander of his army after the battle of Jebus, and then David's mighty men. You may remember these guys if you were with us for our study in 2 Samuel. These were David's elite warriors. They're described in some detail here in this chapter. On to section number three, the rooster is still not awake. Where? Where did these events take place? David was anointed king in Hebron. Later, David conquered the city of Jebus, which we know as Jerusalem, and he made it his capital. Over to our outline section, the rooster is still not awake. <laughs> if you don't know, there's a rooster who interrupts my videos with his crowing literally every day, and something has happened to him. Maybe he was eaten. I wouldn't be sad. Now to our outline section, verses one through three, David is made king. After Saul's death, the people of Israel anointed David as their king. David's ascension to the throne was not just a, an event of, that was brought about by history and political movement, but it was God's will. In fact, God's prophet Samuel had anointed David king more than a decade before he actually received the crown. Section number two, verses four through nine, David conquers the city of Jerusalem. So how does Jerusalem become such an important city You know, in, in the Bible story, not only in the Old Testament, but also even in the New Testament? Jesus spends a lot of time in Jerusalem. Well, this is kind of where it starts, verses four through nine. David conquered the city of Jebus, Jerusalem, from who else but the Jebusites. Joab was the one who took the lead in the battle, and because of this, David ended up, ends up making him the commander of his army. Joab's quite significant to the story of David. David lived in the city, and he built it up, and eventually it became known as the city of David. God blessed David's reign, and Israel grew stronger and stronger under his leadership. Now for our final and largest section, verses 10 through 47, David's mighty warriors. This is almost an exact parallel to what we see in 2 Samuel chapter 23, where the, the same information is given to us. So the remainder of chapter 11 is a record of David's mighty men. That's typically the way you hear them referred to. His warriors were classified into two groups, two ultra elite, or excuse me, three ultra elite soldiers and 30 elite soldiers. The group of three ultra-elite soldiers included a guy named Joshabim, who in 2 Samuel is referred to as Josheb Basabeth, <laughs> Eliezer, the son of Dodo, and Shema. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 11, you'll see the references to those guys. Each man, with the help of God, achieved a, a, an amazing single-handed victory against David's enemies. And that's how they got themselves into this group, this ultra-elite group of just three men. Now, several of the exploits of the 30 elite soldiers are also listed in this chapter. Three of the 30 broke through a camp of the Philistines to bring David a drink of water from the well that was at Bethlehem. Abishai is mentioned specifically. He was the brother of Joab, David's commander. He killed 300 Philistines with a spear. And the text says he was, quote, the most renowned of the 30. But he wasn't quite in that ultra elite three category. Benaiah, who we'll talk about quite a bit in the rest of David's story, he was a valiant man, said that he killed two mighty men of Moab, an Egyptian, and a lion in a pit. And Benaiah was put in charge of David's bodyguard. Asahel, who was Joab's brother that was killed by Abner, he was originally listed among the 30. We also see Uriah listed by name. You remember who Uriah was? 
He was originally married to Bathsheba, but David killed Uriah and took Bathsheba as his wife. Not the best time in David's life, but Uriah was originally one of David's mighty men, which kind of makes David's crime against him even worse. Verses 26 through 47 then contain the names, a long list of names of the rest of David's mighty men. Now it's our final section, the application. The rooster is still not awake. It must be a miracle. Let's talk about it very quickly before he arises. It's interesting to me that a number of brothers are listed within David's mighty men. You know, you have Joab, who's the commander of David's army. His exploits are talked about here at the city of Jebus. His two brothers are actually in the list as well, Asahel and Abishai. They were among the group of 30. There's probably a lesson here about the strength and the importance of brotherhood, both in physical pursuits and in spiritual pursuits. He woke up. <laughs> Aha, chicken, you're too slow. We're almost done. Having brave and honorable companions around you will encourage you to bravery and virtue. No doubt these men inspired one another to accomplish the great things that they accomplished. And this type of camaraderie, I think, is desperately needed in the church. If we're going to win battles on the spiritual battlefield, we need brothers who are going to fight alongside us, inspire us, and continually challenge us to get to a higher and a higher level. If we surround ourselves with apathetic spiritual brothers, then we are going to become an apath apathetic spiritual person. If we surround ourselves with courageous spiritual brothers, we are going to become a courageous person. And as the verse mentions in the Old Testament, iron sharpens iron. If you have a good friend, both of you will make each other better.